Good afternoon. How are you guys Hi. doing? <laughs> Good. Uh, Good. How are you? I'm doing well, um, as well as we can do right now. Um, so we have today, we have Heather Wasson, longtime employee, uh, summer employee at Kodiak Soccer, uh, and Stephanie Roy, another employee with Kodiak Soccer. So thank you both for agreeing to do this. No problem. No problem. Happy thank to help. you for having us. Hey, okay, no problem. Uh, we're trying to just connect and do what we can um, to keep people either engaged in sport, engaged with Kodiak, uh, and try to try to use this time wisely, I guess. So I guess we should start where, where most good stories start. We'll start at the beginning. Um, so Steph, do you want to tell us first how you started even playing with Kodiak soccer? I started playing with Kodiak House League before it was all held at the Fourplex, um, probably in grade three or four. And we were playing at the Trimble field back then, um, before it was even the turf field. And then for Select, I started playing in U12 for that team. U12 and Heather? Uh, yeah, so I started around the same time that Steph did. So I started in U10 with Kodiak. Uh, same thing, they weren't all at the fourplex and they were kind of all scattered throughout the city. And then I started playing um, First Touch in U12 as well, all the way through until U18. So I'll ask a tough question right away because I think it comes up uh, in your grassroots experience. Um, was that a co-ed experience for you or was that a, a female only? Heather, you want to go first on that one? Yeah. So I played uh, co-ed in under 10 um, for the two years, so when I was nine and 10. And then um, when I switched to the first touch in under 12, then it was um, all girls all the way through. Okay. Steph, you, you had the same experience, I imagine you? Yeah, it was the same experience, like U8 co-ed, U10 co-ed, and then U12 is when it wasn't co-ed anymore at first, like, cause we were playing select, I guess, but yeah. So right now that's kind of a hot topic uh, in sport, not, not soccer uh, specific, but really just sport. And do you think that helped? Do you think that hindered? Can you comment maybe a little bit on that experience? Heather, you want to go first? <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I think it's great that when kids are younger, they play with like both girls and guys together um especially and then as you get older and you are playing for select teams I think that it, it makes sense that they're separated into um females and males teams just because when you carry on at university it's the same thing so it kind of carries that trend and we kind of develop at different ages and different levels so I think our skills would be slightly different for a little bit um but yeah so I was I liked playing uh co-ed when I was younger I enjoyed all my time playing first touch on the with the girls, um, but I have also since then played on co-ed teams um, when I was older as well, like as an adult and all that stuff. And it's fun to kind of go back to that again and then get to play with everybody again. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I agree, I, Heather. I agree with that. And I think to starting out with co-ed um, and then moving towards um, each having our own team, but I think to going back to that experience and all of us playing together, it builds on different skills for us, not just soccer wise, but in a cooperation sense as well. No, that's a good point. And, and Steph, you, you kind of take charge of classroom settings. Um, and I've had that conversation with, with teachers too, and you don't separate boys and girls in, in different settings like that. Right. So no, we don't not specifically too, like not in elementary, right? Like we're trying to like, boost confidence in everyone yeah. and I even remember like I, I don't know if you remember Kyle when we were at Queenie but like even in PE then it was quite separated for guys are playing touch football mm -hmm. or girls are playing touch guys are playing flag like it was very much separated and it's not like that at all now no that's true um no. groups were just divided I mean for me at the time as a student, you just think, well, it's, you know, it's an even split. So boys and girls is the quickest way to do it. But yeah. obviously when you kind of dig into it a bit, no, good, uh, really good point. And, and I think too, like when I think back to that and then playing co-ed like U8, U10 and having that competitive experience with both, 
then that was also instilled there. Whereas like the competition was more focused on the guys back in elementary middle when we were in school, whereas now it's like a shared experience between everyone. Yeah, I think that's yeah. a, it's an interesting point. It's interesting to reflect and kind of look back at it. And, yeah. And kind of dig in, dig in a little deeper. Yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll even go into another side topic for Heather, because you would have transitioned, not only in, at that point, but you would have transitioned uh, positions uh, you would have been been starting at this time as a keeper, I, I assume, I imagine. Yeah. Yeah. So I, when I first started playing soccer, I had no idea what I was doing, obviously. So I kind of trialed and played every position like most kids want to. Um, and then people found out that I played basketball. So they thought that I would be really good at catching. <laughs> so I, uh, I played keeper for the first time. I don't know, probably when I was in U10 just to try it. And then I really liked it. And I started playing it more and more. And then when I went into U12, there was a period of time where I played both. So I'd play like one game, I'd play keeper and the next game I'd play out. And then I kind of switched back and forth. And then I realized that I really wanted to just be a keeper and focus on that. So I started playing keeper um, probably my second year of U12 and then all the way through and then into university. And and did you switch with one other player? Like, was it you and that, and then another keeper, yeah. or was it you and then yeah. somebody else? Okay. <laughs> no, it was me and then uh, somebody else who also was playing keeper. Yeah. Gotcha. So we'd each take turns. Nice. And then uh, I think and- I, I think this is a good question too to turn back on to Kyle because I remember <laughs> when we were playing at the Central Queens tournament okay. and you were playing keeper. We were you fourteen. You were playing keeper, and then you went from you. I I can't remember who we, you were playing against. The girls team was watching, but you went from being a keeper to literally taking the ball and then scoring on the opposing team. <laughs> uh, I yeah. Well, looking back at a fourteen year old yeah. boy, it probably had something to do with the girls team there. Um, <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I think that probably drove that. Um, yeah. But no, I, I tried keeper a few times in competitive settings, and um, I was really good friends with our keeper, or the guy I played with almost my whole grassroots and competitive experience. So sometimes we didn't have another one. So to give him a chance to play out, I yeah. uh, we were both the same size. I grabbed the gloves and his jersey. So I was just being a good friend, I think. Um. But even, even like, so positions, yeah, it, it changes things. But what about sports? Because you mentioned you played basketball. Um, yeah. So did you play basketball all the way through? Like, did you have to make a choice? Because I know now there's more pressure, or it feels like there's more pressure. Maybe it was yeah. there um, to pick a, a sport early. So how long did so, you play basketball? So I started basketball when I was a lot younger, um, I think because my mom played basketball. So she didn't like neither one of my parents played soccer. So they knew basketball. So that's what they put me in at first. So I played basketball from the time I was, I think, five or six, maybe. Um, And I always played competitive basketball as well. So it worked out really well when I was younger because the seasons were different. So it wasn't like we didn't have all year round programs at the time. So I would play soccer in the summer and then I'd switch over to basketball in the wintertime. Um, but then as I got older and things got more competitive, then it, it was a bit of a challenge sometimes. So there was a summer that I played, um, basketball in the Brunswick and, um, competitive with first touch soccer. And like I said, I was the goalkeeper. So that year it worked out well because we had another goalkeeper as well. So one weekend I would go to soccer and I would play keeper. And then the next weekend I'd have basketball in the Brunswick. So she would play in nets for me and I would go to basketball. So it was hard juggling it for a while. Um, I did that for one summer and then I decided to play, um, competitive soccer in the summers and just stick to competitive basketball in the wintertime. So I kind of balanced out, but I'm glad that I did play both sports all the way through. So I played them all the way through, um, high school. And then when I got to university, I had to pick, I, I could have played both if I really, really wanted to, but I think it would have been a bit more challenging to balance that with, um, working part-time and focusing on school. So I chose soccer. Um, but yeah, it was good to play both. I think um, it was a nice break for me from both sports. But you're right, there is a lot of pressure now on kids to kind of pick one and focus on it because there is training all year round now. So that's a bit of a difference than when I played. No, I, and I think it, it, it's looked at a good thing. Um, mm-hmm. 
for each, every sport, right? Like they, they yeah. can provide it now. There's more exactly. professionals in, in sport. Um, but no, it comes with the other side of the coin, the pressure. Yeah. And Steph, yeah. you played multiple sports. Yeah. So throughout uh, middle and high school, well, middle and high school, I guess it was whatever was being offered at the school at the time, plus soccer. So soccer would always be the plus outside of school for extracurricular. Um, but it was harder in high school um, playing multiple sports with competitive soccer with first touch because it was more first touch over other sports, right? So did you find that, and I don't know if it's true, but was the pressure coming from, from teammates? Does it come from coaches? Is it just the scheduling? Like where does that? I think it's, I think it was a bit of all of it, not the teammate sense because everyone seemed to be doing something else for an extracurricular, mm -hmm. but it was more that you wanted to make sure that you were showing up in the competitive aspect right and then for at school maybe there was like a sport like I know I really wanted to do rugby um and then in my grade 12 year I had the okay from a certain coach that said hey you could try rugby but then maybe things got a little bit too rough and then I was asked to slow it down a bit and focus more on the soccer aspect but um I found like it was like it was my love was soccer over the other sports first. So I guess it was on me in the end, what I chose to do yeah. and put the effort into. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, in a competitive athlete, competitive at anything, not even athlete, but being competitive, I think you drive yourself, right? Like you try, yeah. Yeah. you try to do well. And, and if you feel like something it, it has to give and you kind of look inward first, probably. Yeah. yeah, I feel like that's the hardest part of it. It's not pressure necessarily from other people or things like that. I think as a competitive athlete, you you want to be there and you want to commit yourself, especially with team sports, to being there for your team. So you feel like when the scheduling gets complicated, it's hard to pick which is more important to me right now. So you, you feel guilty yourself, not so much anybody else being like, oh, what are you going to do? Or like, you should do this. It's more of like yourself basically trying to choose what one you can do and what one you're going to have to put off for now just because you want to be committed to all of it. So it's hard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's fair. And, and you said, you guys mentioned it, it comes in a little bit later, right? Like at first middle school, U10 uh, mm -hmm. soccer, the schedules aren't as uh, busy uh, and it gradually gets to that point. It ramps up. So mm -hmm. decisions um, need to be made almost on a weekly basis back then. I don't know each sport right now, but it, it's, it feels like there's still uh, overlapping schedules and seasons mm -hmm. and, um, so that's important. And I think it's a good learning component too, though, for like us growing up to manage our own schedules, to pick and choose, yeah. like make our own choices. And, you know, like there are some kids that deal with too much going on and then they have to deal with burnout and then they, you want to grow a love for what you're doing, but you also need to make sure that you're doing it for yourself and then um, having a little bit of ownership in what you're choosing to do, right? Yeah, I agree. I think, yeah, it makes people really organized. Like you have to, you have to plan out, like, you know, that you have this after school. So you have to be ready to finish all the other stuff that you had to do, like homework and all that stuff. And then you can go to your practice and then you might have two practices at night. So that means you have to do your homework for the next night beforehand too. So I think the organization part is one thing that I really learned from playing multiple sports at the same time um, and time management, making use of the yeah. time that you do have and then organizing yourself to get ready for what's to come kind of thing. Completely right. agree. <laughs> and, and it almost, um, it mimics more of a university workload almost yeah. because, right, yeah. like um, most times you're not playing um, youth sport every day of the week. Right. Where, whereas at yeah, university, you, you will and you'll have more homework. And so maybe that kind of helps there. I'm not sure. You yeah. both you both bring different uh, expertise, like professionally. Um, when you talk about burnout. So do you see the burnout stuff in class? Like, do you see that in the classroom? Um, you can, you can see it with some students that they're just overloaded with what they're involved in. And like, as like a PE teacher, I am voicing the need to be involved in more than one sport. So you're developing different physical literacy skills that translate through many different sports when you do want to specialize in something. But I feel that some of our kids are just some of them are way too involved in too many things. It could, it's not even sport related. It could be, oh, I have um, music. I have um, 
all these different other activities that they're in. And then they're just kind of like um, trying to figure out what to choose, right? And balance that. But I think too, it comes with um, the pressure to be involved in everything as well. Like if you're involved in a few things, that's great. But if you're overloaded that you, you yourself can't um, be able to go on with your daily routine because you're so burnt out, then I think that's when parents need to sit down and kind of pick and choose what works well for us and what works well for our kid and have that discussion with them. I think that's a major takeaway mm -hmm. is to have the conversation with the athlete, yeah. with the child, because maybe there's something that you think they really like that they could do without pretty easily. Yeah. And Heather, on, on your side of things, you would see maybe more the, the physical burnout or something related to that. Yeah, exactly. So as a physio, I see multiple different people for different reasons. Um, but when it comes to athletes, in particular young athletes, um, I see a lot of injuries from overuse. So yeah. kids who are playing um, sports all year round, multiple sports at a really high intensity. Um, and the issue becomes when they are in a period that they're growing a lot. So that's when I see the most injuries. So people that like kids that are fairly young, so like middle school, high school, kind of transitioning into that period um, because their bodies are developing and at a really quick rate, really. Um, so a lot of times they'll have like a big growth spurt and then they come in with knee pain. And it's, it's challenging to manage that with trying to keep them involved in their sport at the same time. So it's hard to take a kid out of a sport and say, you can't do this because of your injury. Um, and trying to find ways to rehab them and basically kind of adapt them into different um, training styles and different kind of training ideas so that they can still participate but not risk injuring themselves even further. So that's what we see a lot is people that kids that are coming in and playing a lot of sports um, at a high intensity and during that period mostly. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Seth. And just to echo what you're saying too, Heather, it's when they can't go to that sport for a while, what are they going to do in that time, mm -hmm. right? Like to have a different outlet, maybe it's a different activity that's um, not so intense, but yeah. to make that choice and have something to go back on because leaving sport too is a big um, reality when you face it. Like I remember even just leaving high school and then it's like, mm -hmm. well, I'm not going to this and this and this, like, what am I going to do with my time? So I needed to learn how to manage that and find different um, other activities to do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and when, so most of the time when somebody comes in, if they're a soccer player, then I try as much as possible to find exercises for them that are specific to soccer because that's the end goal. That's what they want to get back to. So it's trying to find things that are functionally um, going to work with what their goal is at the end. So if their goal is to play soccer, then okay, what's the issue now and what can we do exercise wise and movement wise to kind of get you back to being able to do that, but not actually doing that yet so that it's not injuring them further. Um, so a lot of that comes, comes down to kind of planning with them and what's going to work with them and what are they going to be able to do at home um, in terms of rehab as well. No, I think that's, that's great. And I think something now is, we kind of touched on it and I think we'll keep going in that direction is when you're done high school, um, or that age, uh, you can be a little older, a little younger, but people almost retire from sport because they've gone through almost a career worth of physio yeah. from the age of 11 <laughs> to 15. Yeah. And, and at 18, they're like, you know, I, I don't know if it's worth it, or I don't know if I can deal with this pain or, you know, I've gotten my fill in, in six or seven years. And, and we see a lot of people leaving sport really young. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and you both transitioned out of sport, but in a different capacity, right? So, so we'll kind of, you both worked at Kodiak Soccer, like we mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. um, so in staying with sports, staying with soccer, uh, taking on coaching roles. Um, so how did, how did that help you maybe progress into your careers or how did, how did that line kind of effect kind of happen for you? Either. Do you want me to start? Go ahead. Yeah, sure. Okay. Go ahead. Um, for, well, for myself as a teacher, like it definitely helped with practicing that teaching role um, and putting that into um, work and doing that like at a younger age. Um, for uh, the physical education component of that grassroots, like even the house league and running the camps there contributed to that um, for some, yeah, I'm trying, sorry, I just froze there. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that, um, 
that definitely put into practice what I wanted to do. And then it also kind of streamlined for me, like, this is actually what I want to do. I do want to teach. I do want to work with students. Um, I do want to better themselves. And I, I do want to add in that physical education component. Um, so the coaching aspect of that helped with my experience going into my teaching degree. And then it also brought um, different experiences into my teaching degree where for practicum purposes and even teaching today um, for building those physical literacy components, um, like the building blocks for those and different cues that I learned throughout those different experiences helped in my overall teaching today. Mm -hmm. I think that makes sense too. I, I, it's weird. You don't know when uh, when something's going to pique your interest like that, and then you continue it. And now you're yeah you're a teacher for X amount of years. Heather, do you want to kind of echo your experience? Sure. Yeah. So um, I, when I was playing in um, university, I started coaching a little bit as well. I always coached in the summers. Um, so I've coached various age groups um, with Kodiak and with South New Brunswick. Um, and I think that being able to uh, coach others kind of is like a, it's almost a way to still be involved. But you, like I was at the end of, after I finished my, like when I was finishing my undergrad, I knew that I probably wasn't going to play as much anymore. Um, so still playing in like the women's league um, indoor and stuff like that for a while. But I think that was kind of like an outlet is I'm not going to, I've did my time and I, I played and enjoyed it, but I want to give that experience back to somebody else. Um, so I started coaching um, in particular, doing a lot of keeper training um, just because it was a passion of mine. And I wanted to kind of be able to share that with other, um, other kids, especially younger ones who weren't sure if they wanted to try out um, being a keeper or not. So it kind of, was a chance for them to have a bit more opportunity to try that. Um, and then just being around sports in general, I knew that I wanted to do, um, to become a physiotherapist when I was in high school. So that was my, my goal. Um, so I think coaching and being around um, athletes and understanding what their training looks like and what the intensity of that looks like and what drills they do has helped a lot with my career now because I can picture when somebody comes in, they say, oh, I play this position or oh I'm doing this drill at soccer and practice and this is what bothers me then I can I can I know what they were doing so it makes it easier for me to understand and try and kind of see where they're coming from and figure out ways that we can um, practice some of those same things uh, in the clinic. Now I'll uh, I'll ask you both the same question we'll start with Heather um, mm -hmm. and how many women I guess did you see or did you have coaching you because I know it's not it's a topic in coaching courses and, and, and everywhere mm -hmm. um, to address that. So how many did you, would you say you had as coaching you before you became that coach? Um, I actually had quite a few um, women coaches. So when I was younger playing first touch, um, I had a female goalkeeper coach um, that I had for a few years. Uh, and then I also had um, a female coach when I played in high school at uh, Harrison Trimble and in university I did for a period of time so we had a female trainer and we also had um, one of them as our head coach for a while as well so I had a mix of both a lot of the times um, I had both so I'd have female and male coaching um, but yeah so I was I was lucky I got to experience being coached by both um, and a lot of the times them working together and kind of collaborating so yeah Steph? Yeah, just to echo Heather, for first touch, I remember having two female coaches uh, for the majority from like U14 to U18, and then uh, high school as well, female coach. And then at the Mount for a year when I played uh, at Mount St. Vincent, we had a female assistant coach. Okay, and, and is that something you would value as an athlete looking back? Is that something you wanted, something you needed? Um, and Steph, you can answer that one first. Yeah, I think you can totally see yourself um, in your coach as like, as a female player, having a female coach, you're feeling represented and having those same experiences some of the time. So I think to see yourself in a coaching position later on in life too, um, that can also drive that for you as well. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It was, it was nice to be able to have uh, both. And especially when it was both together so 
um, yeah, it, it worked out really well. I wouldn't trade any of the coaches that I had or any of the experiences that I had. Um, I think that they all worked out really well and they were all helpful. I learned a lot from um, many of my coaches that I had. Um, and Steph's right. You, you can look up to them and see like, oh, okay, well, when I'm done playing, maybe this is something that I, I can do, or I want to coach this, or I want to coach like this. I want that coaching style. And I want to bring that with me because I know how much fun it was as a player to play for um, certain people. So you kind of take what they did and think about bringing that to the table when you're coaching as well. Yeah, it definitely, like my coaches and my teachers and I, that whole experience in itself definitely drove me to my, my profession mm -hmm. and part of like the pursuit of it as well. And having that mindset of how they taught me to have those positive experiences for my kids mm -hmm. too. Right. Yeah. No, that's a really good point. Um, so we'll get in, I guess, a little bit more into the club side of things. Um, so we were all actually at Kodiak soccer with, uh, the world cup, mm -hmm. um, yeah. for a few years, uh, the world cup was in town and, um, we can still, you can still feel that kind of impact. It, it was long lasting. It changed the sport landscape in, in our city, in our province. Um, but if you guys maybe want to take off in, in into your experience working um, in the summer and then even touching on the World Cup because I know at different capacities we all did things but if you want to touch on your experience uh, Steph you want to lead us off with that yeah so I think we each had two experiences the U20 and then 2015 like Women's World Cup um, for U20 that experience there was more working with I believe we were working more in um, I honestly can't remember. It was more like that Coca-Cola role mm -hmm. and promoting uh, Coca-Cola. But um, when I was working at the Women's World Cup, I was working with the flag bearer. So I got to actually be on the field with all the players and then with uh, those chosen flag bearers from different various clubs in Quebec. Um, and yeah, that was a really cool experience. It was very surreal. <laughs> yeah. Heather? Uh, yeah, so I worked at Kodiak in the summers for uh, four or five years, maybe five, I think. Um, and it was a, a pretty cool experience in general working there, actually. It's a really, it's a really fun summer job. Um, it's busy and organized chaos all at the same time. Uh, you get to meet a lot of people. Uh, you get to do a lot of scheduling. You get to see a lot of different coaching styles. Um, you get to see a lot of the work that comes behind the scenes that people don't necessarily know or see um, when they think of summer soccer. They just they show up at the field for their time and they bring their kids and then they go after that. But there's a lot of organizing and a lot of work that goes on um, behind there that nobody really gets to see unless you've actually worked there. Um, and a lot of it's pretty fun. It's a fun summer job. You're outside a lot. Um, you get to coach a lot. And yeah, so in that there were those two summers that we worked with the um, world cup and volunteered for that um and it was it, like steph said it was a really surreal experience um so we got to one year we did um kind of field setup so i think it was kyle and i and we would go and set up the fields for um, practices and we actually got to watch a lot of the practices so him and i especially at the time were coaching um so we had to see a lot of really cool new drills that we hadn't necessarily seen before, um, just see how they organize their practices, how the players interact, what they do before their practice, what they do during and after. Um, so that experience, um, in my opinion, was probably one of the coolest things that I did during that time was to just be able to watch them practice and see how, how that all looked. Um, and then the second time that we volunteered for it, we were in charge of the ball crew. So we were actually on the field for pretty much every game, one of us at least. Um, we were both down there and we got to watch the games from the sidelines and we got to meet a lot of uh, young athletes who were looking up to these players and um, kind of learned a lot that way. And also all of the work at the same time kind of that nobody else thinks of. They watch the World Cup games, um, but they don't think of all the stuff that goes on before that, the organizing, the planning, um, and just a lot of guidelines and a lot of rules and regulations that they have to follow and that we had to follow as well um, to make it all unfold the way that it did. So yeah, it was, a, it was a really great experience for sure. And just to touch on that too, Heather, I think we were very lucky to work at Kodiak 
and also do this at the same time. Like there wasn't too yeah. much of an overlap with what was going mm -hmm. on in the city and with World Cup going on at the same time. So we were lucky to kind of balance both and get both those experiences. Yeah, we definitely were, especially because of what we were doing. I mean, we were we were organizing things and setting schedules and um, practices and uh, doing summer camps and all that stuff. So to be able to go and learn from that experience and then bring that back to work with us. Um, yeah, it was a pretty, pretty good experience, especially since the three of us were the only summer students at the time and we were all volunteering for it. Yes. So yeah. it, uh, it worked out very well for sure. Yeah, but we made it work and I think we did. That was a better summer for it too to have yes. like even doing the um multicultural festival downtown yeah. and promoting yeah. kodiak there like that was awesome yeah 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 it really was no we 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 get involved uh to say the <laughs> least uh we, we try to we try to spread our wings um and i think it's it's interesting and i i believe we had blackout days um during the world cup we did. yeah yes you're right yeah. that's and, why it worked <laughs> It works. Yeah, it works so on our end that way. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, but really, we wanted people to experience that. We didn't. We didn't need them. No, right? exactly. If a game finished at six fifteen and you had to pick, well, we kind of blacked that out and, and made it work a different way and extended yeah. sessions or whatever we had to do. So, I think it, it is important to make sure those are accessible to as many people as possible. Yeah, for sure. That experience doesn't come around often. And it might be, well, it was the only time that we were going to have the opportunity um, to be a part of it and volunteer and help out and see what it was like. So I'm thankful that we were able to do that for sure. And drive that excitement for our players in the club too, right? Like they were able yeah. to partake in both and not have to pick and choose. So exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and, and we had the opposite. People were saying, hey, we're not coming to soccer. I got my tickets. They they weren't trying. <laughs> yeah, even, they were like, yeah, we don't blame you. <laughs> yeah, we weren't. They didn't want to not hurt our feelings. They were fine to tell us what they were doing. Yeah, and, yeah. and we respect that. We understand that. Like you said, that experience comes. Uh, it's once in a lifetime, really. It, it, yeah. It, I don't know when the next time we'll host the World Cup. So it's important to take take advantage of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you can think of, maybe um, from working at the club that? as a player even cause we mentioned um you were traveling the city at the time so if you had a game you would go from trimble maybe i think maybe mcnaughton maybe to edith cavell where now uh, kodiak soccer is all in one location so can you think of anything as a employee any problems that would come out of that step anything that management wise can you see that working now um, any problems that would come well, even thinking back, because we did, we did have some games at Rocky, right? Yep. And at Trimble that we were going in between still while like grassroots was going on at the fourplex. Yep. Um, and I think it had to do a lot with the weather. Like the weather would just come in. We would have lightning maybe at Rocky Stone, <laughs> but we didn't see anything yet at yep. the fourplex. And then you're getting a call and they have to cancel their postpone. Um, so weather-wise, I think managing around the city that would be uh, a bit of, a bit of juggling to do. That's yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think also when we worked there, um, we also had to schedule all the reps for the games. So we weren't physically at Rocky Stone or at um, Harrison Trimble at the time. We were at the fourplex. That's where we were most evenings. So I think that was sometimes an issue as well because if the ref didn't show up it wasn't like we had somebody that we could just be like oh well this ref is we can just call this person that can come it takes a while for them to get there because they're not actually at the field with us um so that becomes an issue sometimes or if there's any um anything that goes on during the game um whether it's with a coach or a player or some incident that happens it's hard to a little bit more difficult to manage it when you're not actually there and you can't actually see it so you're just getting stories from different people about what happened and it becomes a lot more difficult to find a resolution to the problem when you weren't there to actually see the problem. So I think the refing issue and um, kind of any incidents that occurred would have been more of an issue there than if they were at the fourplex. We could see we could see everything and get over there within like a minute. So that would be one of the biggest challenges I think that we we had at the time. I would just think of like the first day as well, like how many how many parents do we have to kind of guide where to go at the fourplex and what field they need to be on and who's their team? If that was around the city, you would have to know for sure where you're going beforehand. There'd have to be a lot more of us. Yeah. 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 <laughs> really? Yeah. 
So I think that's, yeah, the first night is uh, a chaotic night. It um, is. It's a fun, chaotic night. Everybody's excited <laughs> and yeah, 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 it is. It's it's fun start to the summer, but it's very much busy and seems unorganized, although it's in, as organized as we can possibly get it to be, but it's still, it's, it's challenging for sure. But it's many fun. hours go into that day. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Planning week. and the day of itself. <laughs> Yeah, I think the first week. Let's be honest. I think after the first week, everyone. Uh, <laughs> it's a bit more smooth sailing well after that. Yes. Night. Yeah, the first week is uh, a bit hectic for sure. But no, I think that's. I mean, like you say, it, it, there's a lot of work that goes into it. If it was around mm -hmm. the city, um, it would be more. I think it's manageable, but it would be more, of course. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you would. You probably need a field marshal now in, in today's realities. So. Yeah. Yeah. Different things would happen. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess we'll talk about right now and, and COVID and the the scenario that we're in. So um, what are you doing, Heather, to keep keep uh, yourself going, stay healthy, um, past time? What are you doing right now? <laughs> um, yeah, so I started a 28-day uh, workout challenge. It's online. It's hosted um, by a local gym owner in Fredericton. So she does 28-day uh, uh, challenges online. So I signed up for that. So I have been doing those and I just signed up for her next challenge as well. Um, so I've been doing those every day to keep busy. Um, I also have a puppy and he's uh, very active. So we've been lots doing lots of uh, playing fetch outside and going for lots of runs on the trails here. Um, yeah, so other than kind of being active that way, um, I've also been kind of keeping busy with um, working a little bit. So I'm still working um, three days at home, just doing um, virtual calls and virtual appointments. So that's keeping me busy throughout the week and um, some home renovations. So I've done a lot of painting, um, <laughs> probably more than I should have, but I've done a lot of painting. Uh, I've built a few things. Um, yeah, so lots of home projects and, uh, basically just kind of keeping myself healthy and moving more than anything. Awesome. No, it sounds like a lot. <laughs> I have lots of time, so I have time <laughs> to do lots of things. And Steph, I know your, your reality might be a little bit different, uh, than us here in, in New Brunswick. So you want to touch on what you can do and, uh what you are doing yeah so right now we're doing like a choose your own adventure style of learning with our students and basically each week we're sending out materials um, that they can complete at home and then we're also having live sessions um, so because I'm teaching PE I'm doing body breaks with my students so like a virtual body break uh, about 20 minutes they sign in and we have some different activities to do um, for like at home challenges for myself. I know I'm sitting more, so I can only imagine um, the families and students that um, I teach are probably sitting more too. So each day, um, each week I've been sending home a challenge. It's called the PEG challenge. Um, so PEG stands for play, exercise, gratitude, and giving. And for the PEG challenge, you can think of like a chip click. I have it here like a little clip like that mm -hmm. so the students are encouraged to like clip it somewhere um in their home and then each day they try to achieve those four pillars just for not only physical health but emotional well-being too um and taking care of themselves yeah so for that um there's been some different activities that i've been sending out to my students um with minimal equipment because we don't really know what our students have at home um, and can't really expect them to do certain activities without that equipment either. Yeah. No, it seems like you both have uh, an approach and have uh, some things laid out to keep you busy. I don't need to worry about either of you. <laughs> you both be all right. Um, it's definitely been a learning curve to have be worked for sure. Home. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I think everyone's kind of taking that. And, and I think it's going to be interesting to see what we keep um when we can kind of come back to reality and and normality i guess and see what mm -hmm. what what things that we take uh from all this and we we continue to use and strategies that are going to work in a more yeah, i think that's world. true yeah yeah because some things are um like we've learned from at some so like even the like virtual appointments we weren't offering those before because we didn't need to because we could just physically see somebody 
um, it's more challenging as a physio to see somebody mm -hmm. virtually and not actually able to do like hands-on um, treatments. But it's something that I think because we've started to use will be very useful in the future too because people travel and they still might need to have updated exercises. They still might have pain and want to know what they can do for it while they're away. Um, we also have some older people who may not be able to come into the clinic or might not feel comfortable coming into a clinic. And that way we can still help them as well. So I think it's a good thing that we've adapted um, that and that we can continue to offer it afterwards. So there'll be some good things that come out of it for sure. Um, it's been a learning experience. and It's, it's uh, definitely been a challenge, but I think there are a lot of good things that we can take from it. So that's that's a good thing. No, I, I don't think we'd be we'd be no better off if we didn't learn anything from it. So exactly. yeah, yeah. I, hopefully every, I, everywhere we can. I think a lot of our uh, students are being put into this accountability and resiliency factor right now too, right? Like they can choose whether to do this at home or not, but I think this is a good learning curve for them as well to develop that resiliency and accountability for themselves and have that independence. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. That's a good point. We're saying the same thing about our athletes when we meet as coaches, right? Like, mm -hmm. uh, you can send a, uh, a running workout home, but you can't make the, the legs go right, left, right, left. <laughs> it's really yeah. up to the player, right? So it is about yeah. being accountable. Yeah. Uh, so now we're going we're gonna to move into our um, rapid fire question. Um, so we kind of, we had to go over this one off, off Zoom, off camera. Um, so what we'll do, uh, we'll go uh, Steph, Heather, Steph, Heather, until we're done. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'll start. You can go as quick as you can. It doesn't need to be rapid, rapid, but uh, we'll see. That's all, that's all I'm going to go. So are we ready to go? Yep. Sure. <laughs> okay, so if you had to pick one of your former teammates to room with, who would it be? Heather. <laughs> Too easy. Uh, Heather, if you had to take or pick one of your former teammates to take a penalty kick, who would you pick? Take a penalty kick. Ooh. Yep. Um, let's see. Probably, uh, I'm going to say Nicole Cormier. Okay. She's lead goal um, scorer, so we're going to stick yep. with her. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good pick. That's solid. <laughs> This one is tough, Steph. If you had to pick someone to play you in a movie, who would you pick? To play me in a soccer movie? Any movie. The Life of Stephanie <laughs> Roy. <laughs> oh, God. That is a hard one. That's a hard one. I think I would go with... Let's do a soccer one. Let's just pick Christine St. Clair. Let's do that. <laughs> okay, sure. Uh, Heather, if you had to pick a teammate to sing a song to you, who would you pick? Um, to sing a song to me. I don't really know if we have any singers. I've played any with any singers. <laughs> uh, sing a song. I'll pick um, Kate Matchett. She was a good pony <laughs> singer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you had to watch Netflix with somebody, Steph, and you don't get to pick what you watch, who you uh, who are you gonna let control your Netflix? I'll pick my fiance Brady because he's pretty much on par with what we're watching. So. <laughs> he's well trained. He knows what's up next. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, Heather, if you had to pick someone to go into the middle of a rondo with you who are you going to bring in with you who am i going to bring in with me yeah. mm. i'll bring you ah thanks <laughs> kyle not can many. talk his way out yeah not many Great. would pick me to bring <laughs> to go in the middle. um if someone had to save a pk steph who would you say is going to save one heather saves quite a few pks for us <laughs> over the years so i'll pick heather thanks if it was U12, probably Kelly Vass, because she saved it for us in that <laughs> provincial title. So. The Nets are smaller than U12, I think. <laughs> um, and that's it. That's the rapid fire questions. That's um, 
that's the whole Zoom, really. Um, if you guys have anything you'd like to say, something I didn't ask, something you would even want to message for people right now, because um, it is a different time. We'll give you a little bit of a platform to, to do that, and then we'll we'll say goodbye. If you want to go first, Heather. Sure. Um, yeah, so thanks for having me, number one. Um, it was fun to kind of catch up and chat and um, yeah. So my message, I guess, to everybody would just be to keep moving, stay healthy and um, stay safe. Yeah. Go ahead, Steph. Thanks for having me as well. I didn't have all the answers to all my <laughs> questions right away, but thank you for uh, putting those on me. It's, it's fun to share and see everyone again. Um, and to echo Heather, keep moving, um, just keep safe and be well and the importance of routine and all this and kind of making the best of, out of what's going on. So choose joy. That's great. Thank you both for doing this so much. Thank you.